We're here with Deputy Eamon O'Queeve uh, for the Speaker William Conley Summer School. We're here in Merrion Square, just across the road from Government Buildings and Leinster House. Sir Eamon, Eamon. thank you so much for uh, agreeing to accept our invite to, to do the talk here today on, I suppose, a different aspects to what is Irish identity. We've spoke to Ian Marshall already about unionism uh, and what it, what it is to be an Irish or Northern Irish or British unionist on the island of Ireland. And uh, you're going to I suppose, talk to us today about what it is to be, I suppose, a nationalist uh, Irish person, if we can even use that word anymore. Because over the last 100 years, I suppose, that word has totally changed. Uh, you yourself are the grandson of Eamon de Valera and the son of Professor Breen O'Queeve uh, of Celtic Studies in UCD. So you have a totally different perspective even than what I do on what is Irish identity and Irish nationalism. Well, interesting enough, first of all, I think it's often better to leave some things undefined. And for me, Irish identity is anything that anybody within this island identifies as being important to them. But particularly those things that are maybe slightly different in this island, although there's nothing pure Irish. Uh, and we see that the more you study history, the more you study the history of language and so on, uh, that kind of purity doesn't exist. Uh, the other thing that I have to say, uh, when you travel abroad, and I used to be skeptical about Irish America and Patrick's Day and plastic paddies and so on. And when I went to America as a minister on Patrick's Day, I suddenly realized that this was extraordinary and positive the way Americans have adopted their Irishness and have kept it going three and four generations on and how they really treasure it. And it suddenly changed my perspective on the celebrations that they have, which is another form of Irishness, another form of identity that attaches itself to this island. So I think we need to be very wide in our definition. And of course, if you understand, for example, Gaelic culture or Irish language culture, you'll suddenly realize that Scots Gaelic is a form of Gaelic, it's a form of the same language. When I went to the Isle of Man, they've got uh, another form of Gaelic there. In fact, in ways it's nearer to Irish than even Scots Gaelic. And you suddenly realize that, you know, it went beyond the borders of this island. Uh, Scotland, before the uh, Convention of Drumcat, which was the first style uh, that's recorded, uh, was a, actually a, a province of Ireland and it gave it its independence a thousand years ago. So these connections have all, all mm. been there and therefore this you know, neat def definition that maybe people had of Irishness uh, is actually not well rooted in history. And I, I think we have to have a broad definition of Irishness. Uh, certainly having grown up here in Dublin, the interesting thing about my background is yes, uh, three of my grandparents were involved in the Gaelic League, Sean O'Keefe on my father's side, my two grandparents on the other side, Eamon de Valera, and of course, Sinead de Valera. Uh, but on the other hand, I grew up here in Dublin 4. A lot of the people uh, on the road when I was growing up that I grew up on would have been from the Anglo-Irish tradition. Uh, our next door neighbours and best friends uh, were Northern uh, people who would have come from a Protestant Unionist tradition. So we had a great exposure to different traditions here growing up in the city. Absolutely, yeah. And I think what you just said to me there now, uh, to keep the definition as broad as possible, like I use, I suppose, maybe I suppose incorrectly use the term at the start, uh, the nationalist perspective, was that probably doesn't even fit into the 21st century anymore, maybe. Well, I, I wouldn't agree because no. um, what we really fought for, if you look at it, it's incorporated into the first census of the, the, the Constitution, is that the people on the island of Ireland would decide what happens in this island, not anybody yeah. else outside. Yeah. And that ultimate sovereignty would lie with the people. Hmm. To me, that's still a very noble aim. Indeed. But that must include all the people and must do it in an inclusive way. So it's not a question of just majority rule, 80% versus 20% yeah. of the island and so on. And that was a great fear and maybe legitimate fear to a point of union that it would be always 80% rule against 20%, whereas they had had unionism in Ireland, north and south, uh, before independence had been 20% rule, uh, you know, over 80%, that there would be a reversal of roles. I think what we need to do is encompass everybody and say that all views and traditions will be respected. Uh, 
and not only would you know the political views be respected, but the cultural views would be respected. Uh, and I had the experience over you know an extended period because I was Minister of State when the uh, Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. I was involved in the setting up of the North South Bodies as Minister. Uh, I was on the North South Ministerial Council from 1998 or 1999, I think they were actually set up, uh, right through until 2011. And my experience during most of that time had responsibility for Ulster Scots and the Irish language and waterways. Um, waterways, you could say, was the easy part. Nationalists and unionists wanted to develop the waterways. But Ulster Scots and the Irish language, uh, people would have seen them opposed. But in fact, they weren't, because what I found was there were two minority languages, because for all that Irish is the first language of this state, it is still, as a spoken language, a minority language. Minority, yeah. And what we actually found was that there were quite good synergies between people who were interested in also Scots culture and Irish language culture and respect between them, because they both realised that they had unique heritages and that we could develop both. It wasn't one or the other. So one did not have to be developed exclusive of the other. Yes. And that inclusiveness was the name, you know, the name of what we were trying to do. Uh, they operated separately, but they also had a number of joint events, but they were supportive of each other's causes in terms of finance and so on. It must have been quite fascinating being on the, the setting up of the North-South Council and all those different bodies. Because the North-South Council, since the Good Friday Agreement, has brought together areas uh, on the island of Ireland where we can work and what we agree on and what can be worked on whether it be uh, you know the Irish the Commission of Irish Lights for example is, is now an is now an all Ireland body which yeah. I think in my in myself I think that's I think that's brilliant uh, and Waterways Ireland which is you can travel up and down across the border on the canal and as far as anyone's concerned you're on the, the, the just the one island the one island of Ireland and uh, the language must be also quite fascinating most people, and as you said, Irish is, as, as a spoken language, a minority language. Um, but what I am not aware of, or I'm certainly not exposed to, I should say, is the Ulster Scots language. Um, and it's I, since we started this project, I've been studying more and more the different bodies. And I suppose next year or the year after, we'd love to explore what is Ulster Scots. And here comes a big debate that even people of Northern Unionist tradition debate amongst themselves, is it a language or is it a dialect of mm. English? Mm. And I took a very, very simple view of that. It was set up in statute, therefore I recognised it. And secondly, if those who were promoting it uh, saw it as a language, I saw it as a language. It wasn't for me, I didn't have the competence. And anyway, it wasn't for me to judge that. And to people who say, well, it's really only a dialect, I say, well, is Scots Gaelic an Irish dialect? Are they just two dialects of the Gaelic language, or are they two different languages? languages yeah. Again, I leave that to the experts. Yeah, to decide. Yeah, yeah. I would say the two different languages because I can't understand the Scottish okay. speakers speaking <laughs> Gaelic. But you know, I would yeah. be able to read, for example, the simple prayers we all learn in Irish. I would read those quite easily and see the similarities in the words in, in, in Scots Gaelic. Mm. So, you know, the, the the answer to this problem is it's whatever the person who has the attachment to it, defines it to be. And most cultures are hybrid. And when you look yeah. at Irish music, Scottish music, Irish dancing, Highland dancing and so on, you see the, yeah. you see the crossover. The crossover. Because yeah, the yeah. sea was narrow, it was easier to travel by sea than by yeah. land. Yeah. Uh, you know, northern, northern hurling in County Antrim, as you know, is very strong in the glens of Antrim. Mm. But it could easily have turned out to be Shinty. Yeah. They just made a decision to go with the rest of the island rather yeah. than to go with our Scottish neighbours. Yeah. But the, again, the origins of Shinty and Hurling are, are common, mm. but they've diverged over the years. So I think we just embrace all of this, enjoy it, and don't worry too much about fine definitions uh, and certainly never fight over a definition. And if it's important to somebody else, it's important to me. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's exactly how it should be looked. Uh, that's exactly how it should be looked moving moving forward. Um, where do you see the where would you see the north south body going? Well, there are so many things that, in my view, uh, we can cooperate on an all Ireland basis. Mm. It just makes common sense. 
uh, I remember on a very basic level recently we ran out of railway carriages hmm. and I, my first question was did they have any spare ones in the north because we have a different railway gauge from continental Europe and from Britain so you cannot buy carriages in Britain and put them on the Irish railways they don't fit because our gauge is wider therefore they're a scarce commodity and expensive and very slow to procure uh, but I found that they had none to spare either because they were working at capacity. I did actually think it would have been a good idea if the two railway companies on a very small island with a small, very small yeah. railway setup with a very unique gate could get together and increase the order and buy a few surplus ones as well mm. as the ones that they badly need to keep their boat systems going. It's that kind of practical cooperation. Yeah, it's absolutely. a matter of practicality rather than principles. Yeah. And the whole thing is to move away from creating issues of principle out of out of things that are utter practicalities and never be triumphalist about any progress made. Be humble about it and say we're just doing it in a common interest, north and south. And I find as time has gone on uh, that northern politicians from the unionist tradition are much more willing to engage with the south, more willing to see that our e economic well-being is intertwined. But we also must recognise, and this is interesting in the Brexit debate, that our economic well-being is hugely entwined, entwined with our neighbouring island of Great Britain. And her economic well-being is going to actually hugely influence ours. Uh, and ours will somewhat influence theirs. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you said, throughout history, we've been, taught, we've been intertwined for centuries. Absolutely. And, and that's purely based on the geographical locations of each other, that's never going to go away. So we have to learn to work with each other and keep working with, well, we are working with each other now, I think, at the moment. Uh, and yeah, I think so, but I think there could be a lot more interaction. Mm. I was disappointed over the last number of years. I didn't believe that there was the same drive of unofficial contacts, uh, creation of friendships uh, that maybe should have been there. I think there was a bit of complacency after uh, when the crash happened, that people took their eye off the ball, that there was a bit of complacency that this had been, you know, inverted commas, sorted. But yeah. if we really want to bring the people of this island together in mutual understanding, uh, in mutual agreement that the more we have control of our own destinies, rather than other people deciding for us, uh, the better it is for all of us. If we really want to do this, it's going to be a hard work, a continuous engagement and the creation of friendships. Political meetings are fine, but it's friendships change the world. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't agree with you more. And I think the sporting bodies very much have proven that. Those uh, sporting bodies on the island of Ireland that are, when they fly the flag, I suppose, like the rugby team, uh, are a 32 county team. And you can see straight away the friendships that have been developed there. Uh, there's all across all communities straight away there's there's no problem like you know and i think that's something that we can develop more in the future um and i'm quite fa i mean i'm a history buff uh history and culture i'm fascinated with um and a friend of mine up north a young guy out of queen's university he's in his early 20s and he's in the orange uh the orange order and he says to me if you're doing this project you have to do the story of the orange order Absolutely. and i'm like but sure why would I? I was like, you know, part of me is like, no, 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 so they're Europe North, you don't affect me. He says, no, we've lodges in the South. Exactly. And I he... have an interesting connection because when I was Minister of Community, Rural and Wealth and Affairs, I, I was visiting Monaghan and Cavan and the border communities, minority communities came to me uh, and they raised the issue with me that some of their halls had been burnt down. These would have been uh, halls belonging to the Iron Order. And I was very concerned about this. So I looked at this issue and we came up with a way of giving the Iron Charter money uh, through a fund we had in the department. Uh, I did it because I believed it was right to do it. Subsequently, one of the people involved became Grand Master of the Iron Charter. And when he spoke in Shannon Air and here, I think he took a lot of people by surprise because he specifically named me by name as somebody who had been very, very helpful. Subsequently, there had been a little bit of a problem with an orange march in uh, Belfast. I had been an independent observer there. Uh, there were issues outside a certain church with the way the march was conducted. 
Uh, I went to him, and all I can say, I've never heard any complaints since. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, he died relatively shortly after that. But, you know, I think it's important that when you reach out, people will always reciprocate. And one thing I've learned about life, you know, when you're doing a bargain, lots of people think you have to be last to give in. I actually always say that often in bargaining, negotiation, discussion, whatever, voluntary first movers actually gain the most, not those who are the slowest to move. We're now in the 21st century. A lot has changed in, on the island of Ireland since the 1990s. I suppose in the 1990s, it was, the conversation was more clear, I suppose. We had the North, we had the South, we had nationalism, republicanism and unionism and trying to work on how to bring us all together. Um, but things have changed now, like both North and South were more economically prosperous. We now have a lot of new Irish, both North and South. So where do we go from here? Well, we have the perfect model. The Irish went to America and they became very American, but they still kept a huge attachment right through the generation to the island from which their ancestors came. Nobody in America thinks they're not loyal to America. But all of us from Ireland know that they have this great affinity for this island. Mm. And therefore, I think when we look at the new Irish, we see a template here. That it's important that they keep their roots with the countries from which they come from. And that should be encouraged, encouraged in our schools, everywhere. That they keep that link with their past. But it doesn't ma mean, like happened the Irish in America, that they won't become totally Irish at the same yeah. time. It is possible to have two identities yeah. and to cherish them and to develop them and two mm. languages and three languages, no problem. One interesting thing, uh, I, I funded a survey on the Irish language, a sociological survey on the Irish language. Uh, the attitudes of the new Irish to the Irish language, which was uh, largely very favorable, absolutely replicated the attitudes of society in general. It was no different. And they were as much in favor of the Irish language as you know, the Irish people were. And of course, they don't think multilingualism is a problem, particularly the people from Africa. They are absolutely incredibly good at languages. Two and three languages is common with them. In some cases, more. More, yeah. And therefore, uh, they don't see the challenge of learning another language that we do. Uh, therefore, I believe they can become truly Irish and truly keep that connection with their own identities, whether it be Polish, uh, African, uh, Eastern European or whatever it would be, Asian, it doesn't make any difference. And we should foster the ability to cherish your own identity and to adopt a new identity at the same time. I think there has been a mistake made with people trying to push them to discard their own identities in favour of some amorphous Irish identity. Mm. I think that that would be you know, a terrible shame on the enrichment we can have in this country. And it's great to see all these new Irish adapting Gaelic games but still yeah. waving their own flags when yeah. their own soccer teams are playing. Yeah. And we've a lot to learn from these cultures. Absolutely. Because they have so much to bring. And, and it, I mean, just to be exposed to different cultures from around the world can only make us a better people anyway. Um, I you think know. the whole trick is every culture is a treasure trove. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. I would say to you, I've so fa found so many treasures in the Irish language, but mm. we also know there are great treasures in, in the English language, Shakespeare, yeah. Yeats. And yeah. Uh, and Keats and all the different poets, mm, Shelley mm. and the Anglo-Irish poets and the British poets and so on, and that it's a very rich language. But also, uh, I found in my knowledge of Irish that there is a huge wealth there. It's a very different wealth, mm. but it's an incredible wealth of thought because culture is about thinking, it's about feeling, it's about emotion. And therefore, we should cherish all cultures and learn from all cultures and not shut any culture out. Uh, one small thing I always remember was my father visiting Galgorm Castle, which is in Ballymean in County Antrim, uh, when I was a child. And the reason he went there was that there was a lady there called Rose Hogan, who was a, a, an aunt of Lord Brookborough. But she was also known in the Irish language as Roshan Yogan, and she was a very fluent Irish speaker. And she wrote the Dunra, Gaelge. Uh, and she had this dual, if you want, personality or, uh, or cultural allegiance. Uh, she came from the big house in County Antrim. As a lot of the early language revival, uh, revivalists did, she would have known Douglas Hyde and visited him in the, when he was president in Ars Nuftran, and she used 
uh, you know, visit the union clubs in Belfast. I suppose we were brought up knowing that this was going on because my father used to visit Galgorm Castle to look at her, to examine her writings. Uh, so this idea, as I said, of a much wider view of culture uh, and of people was part of, funny enough, of mm. my upbringing and has been a great help to me in my later life. And that leads to the challenge of identity, the ch big challenge of identity on our island, um, the cause of partition between unionists with loyalty to the crown and the nationalists who saw the total sovereignty within the island. And one of the challenges going forward as demographic changes and as Ireland changes and particularly as Britain changes dramatically is how as the North and South move closer, as unionists and nationalists move closer, how do we show respect for the unionist identity, for their affinity to the Crown, which to most people of the Republican tradition is something they have no attachment to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I floated the idea many years ago that in the event of a new dispensation on this island, that you know I would have no difficulty with Ireland being a member of the Commonwealth. Lots of people were shocked. The Commonwealth has no jurisdiction. It is purely a place where people meet. They have the Commonwealth Games, they have Commonwealth conferences where they talk, but there is no uh, central lawmaking body. But the Queen is titular head mm -hmm. of this collection of nations. And the point I made was Nelson Mandela, Mandela who had suffered hugely at the hands of white people in South Africa, insisted that South Africa would re rejoin the Commonwealth. As a black African who had no connection, family-wise, no matter how far back they went, with England, because he knew that the war communities in South Africa, who saw their roots initially as colonial background, if it was good enough for Nelson Mandela, it's good enough for him, no creeps.